Good afternoon, everyone. And let me express my immense gratitude and pride at being able to welcome you to this very, very exciting panel discussion on a very, very exciting project uh, that we've been able to, to complete and quite fitting that it should have happened during Pride Month in South Africa. I'm Dr. Anastasia Thompson. My pronouns are she and her. You will be hearing from me a little bit more later on. Um, but to open, I'm going to hand over to our one of our esteemed guests, uh, Zukiswa Kamini from the National DOH. Zukiswa, over to you. Thank you. Uh, as I've been introduced, I am Zukiswa from National Department of Health in the HIV, AIDS, and STIs cluster. First, I'd like to acknowledge the Southern African Clinician Society for giving me an opportunity to give these opening remarks for the launch of these guidelines. Let me say all protocol observes. It gives me great pleasure to be with you today at this very important launch of the Southern African HIV Clinician Society Gender Affirming Healthcare yes. Guideline for South Africa. Let me take us back to the country's response to HIV STIs and TB, the NSP 2017-2022. Objective three of the NSP can articulate that no one should be left behind. This refers to all vulnerable and key populations, including transgender populations. I am here today on behalf of the National Department of Health to confirm that the department continues to support equal rights for all and recommends that all populations be offered same interventions for prevention, treatment, and management of HIV, STIs, and TB. To achieve this objective, the department together with implementing partners developed a key population sensitization toolkit that outlines the framework for all healthcare workers and allied healthcare workers to provide services to key populations. The training for the toolkit is being rolled out as, in, in as many facilities as possible. We are therefore updating the implementing guidelines for key populations. While we have just over a thousand high transmission areas, we strongly recommend that all populations utilize public health facilities for services. I would like to commend the clinician societies for the launch of this gender affirming health care guidelines for South Africa, as this will provide much needed guidance for implementers. This guideline provides evidence informed best practice recommendations to enable all South African healthcare providers, including psychosocial and allied healthcare professionals, to offer quality affirming services to transgender and gender diverse clients. In addition, this guideline will provide a support to transgender and gender diverse clients when accessing healthcare services. As mentioned before, the National Department of Health is committed to removing barriers to accessing healthcare services for transgender and gender diverse persons. The protection of human rights is enshrined in our South African constitution. And as such, we are thrilled and proud to be here today as part of the launch of this important guideline that will go a long way towards reducing the marginalization, prejudice and threats to safety that transgender and gender diverse populations currently face in South Africa and globally. This guideline, which will undoubtedly require ongoing revision and engagement, is a reflection and refinement of the current evidence within the field in consultation with transgender and gender diverse communities and healthcare providers. It represents an important first step made in good faith towards creating a practical tool founded in robust scientific evidence lodged within a human rights framework and intended to facilitate access to skilled and sensitive care that will yield tangible benefit to this unique and important group. We acknowledge and thank all those involved in its development and we wish you good conference. I would like to thank you all for listening. Over. 
Zuki, so I thank you for those profound and very, very important words. Um, I will now hand the floor over to a very esteemed colleague, a very seasoned activist, um, and a representative of SANAC today, Steve Letzika. Steve, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Program Director, uh, and good afternoon to uh, colleagues. It's so wonderful to connect uh, with all of you, uh, and I'm appreciative of the Tlidishel Society for this gathering uh, and for pulling a multi-sectoral conversation uh, during this conference. I am super excited, uh, Program Director, uh, on so many levels, uh, not only just because we are gathering here, brought together by the Clinician Society uh, uh, here, but we are launching a much awaited uh, and deserving gender affirming healthcare guideline uh, uh, um, uh, in South Africa. And I think one, we should commend the fact that in the region, it doesn't exist anywhere else. And South Africa in the region of Africa becomes the first. So I think we need to applaud ourselves, um, you know, for this uh, instrumental uh, uh, guideline, but also a, a very catalyst approach, um, you know, we have taken. Um, and, and, and I'm really quite excited to see all the, you know, activists, advocate and specialists, experts, gathering here, uh, um, you know, to see this, uh, um, you know, uh, as one of the, uh, um, you know, milestone in our health response, um, but also in our HIV response that we see this uh, coming to life. I want to also uh, commend um, the team because this is timely, where as a country, um, you know, we have deferred our NSP with another year. And this is a milestone that needs to be recognized. And I'm, I'm just wanting to affirm that even in our next um, uh, 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 SANEC plenary, which is uh, co-chaired with the deputy president, we will highlight this milestone. And I'm hoping even the coming World AIDS Day and conference, we will highlight this milestone and, and celebrate uh, uh, this most important uh, uh, step. You know, what we know is that every person uh, who seek health care should be affirmed, uh, respected, uh, understood, uh, and not judged. And, and while we have experience in our country uh, 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 here, but also globally, um, you know, we've seen a quite um, a, a lot of uh, uh, people who actually are not respected, affirmed, um, but also services that are not competent uh, for that matter. And, and when we know trans and gender diverse people have experienced significant marginalization and discrimination in the healthcare settings, and this is not news to us, um, you know, this body of work, this research, this evidence that has demonstrated you know, discrimination, stigmatization within the healthcare setting that continues. Uh, uh, and, and this guideline is a stepping stone uh, for us that actually seeks to challenge, you know, the current healthcare settings, uh, but also to ensure that the health professionals working in the, in, in the health sector, you know, continue, um, you know, to be prepared, not only just by service provision, but by the content and curricula uh, that provides appropriate and confirmative uh, uh, um, health care to trans and, and gender diverse people. So I really want us to commend this uh, uh, stepping uh, uh, stone in, in a very positive manner. I think one would realize and reflect on where we come from as a country um, in our HIV response, but particularly for the key population 
or even for the LGBTI. And I recall very well, you know, one of the first generation of national action plan uh, in the 90s that responds to AIDS, uh, uh, HIV. At that time, it was a crisis where our country was in denial, um, you know, and even when there has been multiple uh, uh, fights by the people living with HIV and like-minded allies um, to getting our country to a malicious compliance, and that's what we had at that time. But we came to a realization, and we, one would have seen the, uh, um, um, the, the one would have seen the transformation that has happened over time, even with our generation of NSPs and the. NSP that was in 2007 uh, to, to 2011 was the first one to actually name, uh, you know, uh, LGBTI or specific uh, 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 transgender uh, uh, at that time. And we've had um, the 2012 to 2016 um, and even the current one, which is clear. And I think what is fundamental about the current National Strategic Plan, we launched the NSP together with the LGBTI plan that has direct uh, 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 link uh, or strong uh, 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 health need for transgender and, and gender diverse people. And it, there were clear and call that were made by both the NSP and the LGBTI plan about gender affirming health care. And I think this is instrumental um, you know, to look at this. But what is key and what is fundamental about this guideline um, we, 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 we also are looking at the era where WHO has depathologized. And, and I think it's something that we need to, uh, you know, as a catalyst approach, ensure that our health system depathologizes. Um, you know, the medical professions through the classification uh, uh, that we have seen over time around uh, DSM and uh, ICTs, all these when changing and, and needs to be removed uh, 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 in a way that does not actually perpetuate the, or further pathologizes uh, uh, trans and gender diverse individual. And um, it's quite important when we speak about experience uh, and signal the, the, the disparities, but also the increased burden of diseases. Uh, one of the other elements when we look at health uh, uh, needs, it's not only just to look at the biological, uh, uh, um, you know, driver of the epidemic, but we also need to look at what are the other social and structural drivers and even behavior for that matter. So, so, so we have quite a lot of work beyond just a biological, a biomedical aspect. We have to also look at areas of mental health and and, and other health disparities, um, you know, that originates from discrimination and systematic biasness, um, which have contributed to the decreased access uh, to care, uh, particularly for trans and gender and non-conforming or gender diverse individuals. Uh, we have a long way. We are aware as the council, we have a long way. We are aware as a country and myself as one of the members of the LGBTI community, um, we have a long way. We have quite hard work to do. We need to change attitudes and um, even beyond healthcare workers within society. We have to uh, uh, work towards ensuring that the health facility, South Africa has got quite a number of huge uh, 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 health facilities from primary health care, but also to hospital settings uh, and so forth. Every hospital, every facility should be providing gender affirmative uh, health care. And, 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 and while there are specialized services, those specialized services will be, of course, uh, um, be provided by the specialist uh, medical uh, uh, specialists, but the basic baseline of healthcare should be provided at a non-discriminatory element. And, and these are some of the things that creates low health seeking behavior. These are some of the challenges that we are dealing with when uh, people have to access uh, the health uh, uh, care services. And we have to do it in a manner because our agenda is universal health care uh, coverage. And we have to do it in a way that our systems have got or received primary uh, critical education, 
uh, from curriculum, but to services. I'm quite excited and I want to congratulate everybody and that has been involved in this. This is a one step forward. Uh, our government, civil society, private center and development agencies have to gather behind ensuring that this guideline does not just become a paper, but is a guideline that becomes an actionable point to advance uh, affirmative services. So program director, without any waste of time, uh, I want to allow others to enjoy the excitement that I share uh, with, with all of you. Thank you so much, back to you. Thank you so much, Steve, for sharing that with us. Um, some incredibly important concepts coming across there. It falls to me now to set the scene and the tone for the panel discussion uh, that lies ahead. And it's a it's kind of an interesting challenge because I'm tasked with doing an introduction and then I'm gonna hand over to two other members from my team whose actual topic is the introduction. Um, and I would want not to duplicate any content for our, our very esteemed viewers who are joining us today for this incredible discussion. Um, what I will reflect on at this point is really just to say that we as a team of individuals, healthcare workers, community members, um, and as you'll hear a little later on, it was very important to us that people from the trans community should be involved in the process of creating guidelines to ensure that these guidelines are representative, are affirming, are empowering to this community. But we, we really assess the need for something like this. And we realized that it was exceedingly overdue that clinicians in South Africa were either approaching the treatment of patients in the transgender and gender diverse community from a position of ignorance. And I don't, I don't mean willful ignorance, but I mean, they simply didn't have the tools and the resources and the education and the knowledge in order to help their patients in a way that was appropriate. Um, or alternatively, that there were instances where we'd see extreme bias and prejudice and discrimination leveled against people in this community and and we know it's important to talk about you know i i opened the session and i reflected on the fact that it's pride month in south africa and, and as an activist in the community i am often asked to speak at events and the volume of invitations that i receive tends to grow dramatically during pride month one of the things that i'm always quick to say is that Pride is not about celebration and parades and ribbons and confetti and waving rainbow flags. Pride is political. Pride is revolutionary. Pride is philosophical. Pride is an act of defiance against structures and institutions dating back decades or sometimes even centuries that are so biased and so prejudiced against minority groups, such as those in the LGBTQIA plus community, and especially against trans people. And Pride is about reclaiming that space and saying that we're not going to, to live in shame anymore, that we're going to take back some of the tools and the words and the vocabulary and the language that has been weaponized against us. And we're gonna to try to do better. So pride, pride really at its core is about human rights. And I think it's human rights. If I had to pick a single phrase or expression that encompasses and encapsulates to the greatest extent possible, the ethos behind the development of these guidelines, it was about human rights. It was about recognizing that a system that has acted with, and I, I won't pull my punches or sugarcoat my words, a system that has acted towards people in the trans community with violence is no longer acceptable and is no longer excusable. 
And I think it's really incredible how a team of people pulled together to put this, this guideline into action and, and to see it to completion. And I say completion with reservation because we, we know that this is something that is going to have to be revisited and revised and reviewed as the science changes, as the language changes, as everything changes. But it represents a significant starting point. We have something to build on. We have something that is our own as Africans, as Southern Africans, as South Africans. And I think we, we really intend and want this document, this guideline to be useful to clinicians, but over and above that to belong to the community and to be a tool to help this community in protecting and defending their own human rights and advocating for themselves and ready in upholding that, that basic fundamental concept of human rights, which is access to affirming healthcare. And we've gone beyond that as all here. We're not limited to hormones and surgeries and, and psychology. We go much broader than that. Um, so I hope that that has whet all of your appetites for the discussion that is to come. You will certainly hear more from me a little bit later on. So I hope I'm, I'm not boring you to absolute tears. I'm certain that our next presenters who will discuss and present to you on the introduction to this incredible, incredible document and everything that went into it, um, Chris and Savuka will not bore you to tears. Um, they are very capable, very skilled, very talented. It is my absolute pleasure to hand the floor over Chris and Savuka we are in your hands, lead us. Well, good afternoon to everyone, um, or good day to everyone for the people that's not in our afternoon. Um, it is for me a great pleasure to also now form part of the introduction team here today. Um, and I'm going to introduce uh, with Savuka today. And, and we thought it, it might be very good that the two of us start off with the introduction. So a little bit of history. This, a whole guideline was not one day decided upon and we jumped in and we just started doing it. It has been a dream for years of trans people to have affirming guidelines, guidelines that they could use and could work with and a tool that can help trans and gender diverse people to access gender affirming health care. Simultaneously, it was also a space where um, the healthcare providers started speaking around how should we do it, how can we come together and really serve the trans and gender diverse community. And so out of these two, in a certain way, quite often we think about civil society on the one side and healthcare on the other side. Out of these two needs and dreams and wants, it became a document that came from both sides and merging into one. And I think this is this kind of working together, this tension that sometimes arose through the whole process, because who's the real experts? Would we say the experts are the healthcare people that studied for so many years the ideas of gender affirming healthcare, the ideas of medicine, psychology, psychiatry, speech and language and social work, the physicians out there, should it be them? Are they the experts or are the people with their lived experience, the people that lives depend on gender affirming health care, are they in the end really the experts? But in the end, through a participatory approach, we came together and we found a space to learn from one another and to create 
a South African-based guideline. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague from the um, civil rights spaces to also add to this introduction before we go to what this whole guideline is built upon. Savuka. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good day, uh, panel, and good day to all the uh, viewers today. Uh, my name is Savuka. I'm from Gender Dynamics, uh, a gender non conforming uh, activist and health advocate officer. And I'm really proud also to be a part of this uh, profound process. Very needed um, guidelines, much, much needed in light of the very limited access um, to healthcare and recognition of trans and gender diverse bodies in, in Southern Africa. And so to have this general platform where healthcare providers, um, activists, uh, community based organizations, uh, community individuals, to speak to how they would like uh, the healthcare space to recognize them and to affirm them was quite a, a quite necessary and profound process to be part of. And the quite the strong foundation, I think, for these guidelines speaks to the idea of dignity and quality and access, which are some of the uh, key fundamentals that our very own constitution is based on. Um, also, um, Dr. Anastasia mentioned the idea of human rights, which is really uh, uh, an essential part of the recognition of trans people to affirm who they are based on these principles internationally, as well as uh, the South African principles stand by the constitution. And so we really are proud to um, have a space um, where we can engage and introduce uh, some type of paradigm where we hope that uh, community members can access um, a space where they can assert their rights and affirm their bodies, but also that the, the healthcare spaces, the hospitals, tertiary institutions, uh, practitioners can also have a guideline that will recognize um, the need um, and the journey that trans and gender diverse people go through um, in order to affirm them and in order also to have a space where they can access healthcare um, quite efficiently. Um, so, as I said, that is quite important that we recognize that the constitution itself gives a foregrounding that's quite essential to um, understanding where we can recognize transgender diverse people as human beings who deserve to be recognized, who deserve the, the dignity that's um, um, affirming of who they are and their gender, respective of where they are, class, race, um, demographic, etc. And these are some of the principles also that are reflected in uh, the South African Health Professions Act. Um, they're reflected also in the health um, rules of ethical rules of the health professions, um, the social services professions, the constitutions of professional association of transgender health in South Africa and the Psychological um, Society of South Africa, as well as the Department of my two uh, parallel principles that um, guide in, in ways in which uh, uh, public servants can engage uh, uh, patients or clients um, seeking health care. So if we speak generally to the idea of, of gender affirming health care, um, we speak uh, holistically here and we speak of um, the idea that trans and gender diverse people require space that attends to their mental needs, their physical needs, their health needs, and their social well-being as a holistic human being um, that is um, in, in need of a, a holistic um, engagement from professionals. So um, often than not, then it requires a panel of individuals uh, of diverse expertise to speak to these various um, needs and um, levels of engagement of, of access that trans and gender diverse people through the journeys of affirming themselves and their identities I would need to um, uh, fully embody. And so this is, it's various for everyone. Um, a, a certain trans uh, or gender diverse person going through uh, the journey of gender affirming uh, healthcare will not necessarily have the same journey 
as another. And so this does require us to have a, a kind of a holistic engagement with the individual to ask, what do you mean when you mean gender affirming? What part of uh, certain practices, certain uh, therapies would you require to affirm your own gender? And as, as Steve as a profoundly mentioned that it's quite important to have um, this recognition of the human um, because then it opens up access, it opens up uh, the space for one to engage, um, the, the, the spaces of, of access of healthcare without fearing discrimination, without feeling prejudice, um, and being able to then fully cater for the needs that they have um, as, as um, required by their, their health goals as well. So the guidelines in themselves are intended to provide an evidence-informed best practice recommendation um, that can help uh, narrow some of the gaps that we uh, trans and gender diverse people experience when accessing healthcare. And this includes the stigma and discrimination um, that people then uh, uh, meet or engage uh, when they uh, visit respective uh, institutions seeking healthcare. And so also to enable the South African healthcare providers uh, which would be psychosocial, allied healthcare professionals, uh, medical professionals, surgeons as well, to offer quality affirming services to transgender clients that are much duly deserved. Um, over to you, Chris. Thank you for that. I'm just trying to move our slides which is not happening now. And perhaps maybe just to uh, give a base that um, in the introduction, we will be covering uh, a large element of some of the values um, that are underpinning the approach to these guidelines, as well as some of the key terminologies that will be used that could help perhaps um, uh, give the, the people reading the guidelines some better perspective in terms of understanding the paradigms that we use to approach um, some of the, the, the key um, uh, presenta presentations here today. So we'll be going through uh, that with uh, Chris and myself uh, in the next few minutes. Thank you for that, Savuka. So we use certain key values. And as we had all these discussions and interactions with one another um, through the different organizations, uh, the different people from healthcare, we, we found that there were certain central values that stood out for us. And, and it became very important for us to also base these guidelines um, on these. And, and I think the most important one for us was the whole concept of affirmation, that we affirm the person and that we respect the person for who they are. And, and we have realized through um, our reading, through our research, that there is such a full spectrum of gender identities and diversities. And for years, in especially healthcare, we saw this as a mental health concern, up to the point that we saw it as a pathology, a psychopathology. And, and realizing and also acknowledging that this is part of a person's gender identity, who they are. And there are so much diversity. We came to the point of saying that affirmation must stand central also in these guidelines. We are very aware that there are different other aspects that, that brings us into this space. So we know that our health care and our society is based on a very traditional Western binary cis heteronormative understanding of what femininity and masculinity is. And, and then we're also very aware that we're in a certain political and social cultural context that South Africa is based in, where there's certain gender roles, there's certain ideas about gender. But at the end of the day, we need to affirm our trans and gender diverse clients. And how do we do that? Well, in our constitution, we know we have a right to dignity. There's a right to be respected and protected. And 
we need to acknowledge that people who gender identity and gender expression does not fall within the heterosis normative understandings and that is quite our society as well we still need to move beyond that and we need to then in the end start confronting this stigma this discrimination this even violence that comes from society itself and the only way we can do that is really through competent and affirming healthcare, where it upholds the person's dignity. And, and there's just very basic ideas even there. The way that we incorporate a person's pronoun, the real name that they want to be known as, how we can affirm them by creating our spaces to be safe and affirmative for our clients becomes very important. So Fukuro, maybe you want to share a little bit more about equity and inclusion. I think you're still on mute, Savuka. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, I think it's quite important that we do uh, uh, jump from the idea of dignity being quite an essential part, um, recognizing that um, we come from diverse backgrounds and in that diversity there's a history there that um, often than not marginalizes other groups and upholds the privileges of others. And so speaking to how that dignity can be um, understood would be through the, the frame of equity um, that in fact um, in our various spaces we all deserve um, the right to health care, the right to recognitions, uh, freedoms from violence, from criminalization, um, recognition on a broader spectrum of our identities, um, race, gender, sexual orientations, etc. And, and so we take from the Yogyakarta principles, which are internationally recognized principles that speak to the equality and the idea that we all should have be subjected to um, unfair discrimination. So this really does give us a foundation in which we can uh, propel forward in, in recognizing the need for uh, health status for transgender people that is equivalent to others, regardless of where they come from, uh, regardless of, of their socioeconomic status. And we understand access particularly is an issue um, within our own country where um, we have um, quite disparities in accessing healthcare due to uh, the socioeconomic status of, of some individuals as opposed to others. And so how we can frame perhaps this access to, to gender affirming healthcare should be cognizant of um, the various ways in which other people are often marginalized and um, set aside from access um, or, or than others. And so the idea is that we need to then uh, have ways in which we also engage the healthcare providers to challenge the forms of abuse and stigma, inequality and oppressions that are often directed at t uh, transgender and gender diverse minorities um, based on either Christian orthodoxy, based on traditionalism, uh, based on personal bias. Um, that is really unconstitutional, but because um, such values are some of the values underpin our, our communities um, that are quite very uh, difficult to uh, uh, divorce from. But in a space, a space of um, inclusion, diversity, a space of recognition, and a space of affirmation, um, we should recognize the human being as, as equal, regardless of our own ideas of prejudice. And so we're hoping that a, lot, a large part of how we introduce these guidelines can speak to, to that necessity. Also, inclusion as quite an important aspect will also engage how we need to recognize transgender diverse individuals as part and parcel of uh, law abiding citizens who deserve the full protection of the law and who deserve uh, policies um, that are inclusive and that speak to them. Um, directly. Um, we've recognized that in a lot of ways of understanding gender um, as 
binary and as um, either hyper-masculine or hyper-feminine, we often uh, blur the lines and mar um, the rec uh, recognition and the validity of other gender identities and expressions that often get sidelined and, and not included uh, when it comes to engaging them, when it comes to policy, when it comes to research. So this inclusion is quite important so that we can um, get the language terminologies, the space and platforms, the discourse to embody um, also transgender diverse people to broaden the conversation, to include various ways in which we can understand um, service delivery that's more inclusive and more um, uh, uh, reflective rather of our constitution. Maybe we can move on to the next slide, Dr. Chris, and okay. speak um, to the, the informed consent. Perhaps you can engage us on that. Yes, thank you for that. So in healthcare, we were quite known quite uh, through the ages um, of gender affirming healthcare to become this gatekeepers of deciding if somebody is trans enough or if they present well enough or the idea of, I think this person can access gender affirming healthcare. And, and that was a very top-down approach that we saw. Now, we've already seen a lot of our gender affirming healthcare people moving away from that stance because it is a very unethical stance in the end to decide on other people's bodies and if they're good enough to transition or not. If we look at the informed consent process, we find that the trans and gender diverse person in the end has a say about their body. And we know that the trans and gender diverse person knows the most about their body and who they are and the, about their identity and what is there inside of them. Part of the informed consent model though is the whole idea of providing the client or the information they need to understand what it entails in the gender affirming health care. So if they access hormones, this is what they could um, think would happen. If they um, access surgery, these are the risks, these are the benefits. Now we know that most trans and gender diverse people already did a lot of um, research in this field. And, and it is more sharing knowledges and, and really getting to know where the person is as we do the informed consent process. But we also have people accessing that have never heard even the word trans. So where I work, especially in rural healthcare, we have a lot of people coming in, knowing in themselves what is their gender identity, but have never heard the word trans. And through that, we also share knowledges that the person then can access gender affirming healthcare on their own ideas and understanding and give her informed consent. And, and this speaks to the ethical principles in healthcare. And there's an amazing, great article that Anastasia wrote in this area of what is the ethical princ uh, principles in gender affirming healthcare. We, we look at autonomy and beneficence and non-maleficence and justice, because in there it, it's the fairness of equity that people can access health care to live freely in this world and also be freely themselves. I know we are running out of time. So I'm just going to work over then also to the whole idea of the participatory approach that comes from um, the idea of Ubuntu. Now we know it's a real African concept, it is part and central to our South African democracy. But we also need to understand that when we speak about gender affirming healthcare and we start speaking about transitioning, it is about a community walking with our trans clients this path. It is interdependentness. And we need to come from a more decolonial aspect and start basing it on the African wisdoms, where we also then incorporate the Bartu Pele principles. And we also acknowledge the idea of transgiftedness. Now, quite often, 
in guidelines, we do not acknowledge the idea of what our client brings their understanding. Now, we know through research, it has been proven that trans and gender diverse people are more resilient than our cisgender population, because as they traverse the difficulties of the cis normative world, where there is so many things that they have to overcome, they become very resilient. And they also bring to the table unique perspective and insights through their lived experience. So these guidelines comes from the idea of utilizing a strength-based perspective and a whole idea that we are not looking down and pitying our trans and gender diverse individuals, that we're not saying that they are victims from our society, but rather acknowledging that there has been stresses that they had to live through, and we build on the strengths that's already there. And we acknowledge that trans and gender diverse people are part of our community, and they bring a unique perspective into this field. So for Sabuka, we have two minutes. I'm going to ask you maybe to then to just wrap it up for us. And then we're going to hand over to Zama and Alma. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, sorry, Chris. Um, so I had been tasked to speak on some of the terms um, and perhaps we can uh, quickly uh, slide through them for a bit. Um, so that we can just understand briefly of what we mean in terms of uh, the various terms that we used. And, and so we need to understand the gender element from how, uh, differently from how we've previously historically understood it um, as uh, a traversing or um, um, emanating from sex, but gender rather as a construct of uh, expressions and behaviors and identities um, that are socially organized. And so it is this conversation of the organization of gender um, that uh, makes it possible for us to understand uh, gender as multiplicities um, instead of uh, emanating from the, the sex characteristics of an individual. And so we then have cisgender um, as a person's gender identity that express, uh, uh, that matches uh, uh, their sex assigned at birth uh, as according to how society has understood it. So you'd find your uh, man being someone who was born um, perhaps with a penis or a woman, someone who was born with a vagina. And, and so uh, transgender as, as opposed to that would be uh, speaking to a person who then is uh, associated with uh, being defying rather as a female. And, and so gender dysphoria then comes in that uh, incongruency of growing up um, or understanding yourself as a certain identity, a gender identity, and expressing yourself as that. Um, but then being perceived or being engaged um, as sincere or dysphoria then uh, causes a bit of a difficulty in, in the person experiencing um, this um, disjuncture. And, and so the idea of uh, seeking gender from healthcare is then perhaps to alleviate some of that incongruency that one might be experiencing. Gender expression would be uh, speaking to the behaviors and appearance. And identity would then be the felt internal and individual experience of a person's gender. Speaking to um, the cis-heteronormativity would be then the ideas of um, one should be either a male if they're born with a penis or, or, or female rather, men or women, um, a woman if they're born with a vagina. And the idea that this system is the only system that matters, um, as well as the sexual engagements or sexual relationships um, that the system would uh, prefer, which would be the power dynamics between men and women. 
through the heterosexual relationships. And so this also this is some heteronormativity, something that the trans trans giftness that uh, was earlier mentioned uh, speaks against, or rather tries to alleviate to open uh, platforms and, and ideas and engagements of the various um, ways in which gender can be perceived and sexual orientation as well. Intersex people are people who are born with characteristics of chromosomes that do not fit the binary notions. LGBTQI would be the umbrella term, speaking to the various sexual uh, orientations, gender identities, and sexual characteristics, including lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer. Um, misgendering would be speaking to uh, intentional or unintentionally using an incorrect pronoun to describe someone. Um, this is often mitigated by either asking if you are not sure um, what people's pro co correct pronouns are um, so that you don't uh, avoid, you avoid uh, misgendering them or confusing them yourself. And dead naming then would then be calling someone's uh, name, um, whether that be the name that's reflecting on the ID or historical name, knowing fully well that they don't identify with that name anymore. When we speak about hormone therapy, we speak about naturalizing hormone therapy or feminizing hormone therapy, which would be then the therapy that people uh, engage, the, pro uh, the process people engage when they seek to affirm either their masculine or feminizing gender. We use uh, testosterone to naturalize and estrogen to feminize. Lastly, we have uh, a myriad of gender identities, including non-binary individuals, who would then uh, be people who don't necessarily fit into the traditional binary roles, um, or would be fluid, um, or uh, uh, not at all uh, linked to either of the two. Sex speaks to the physical, char physical characteristics, including hormones, genitalia, chromosomes, etc., that would be then assigned to either one's maleness or femaleness in terms of their sex. Um, sexual orientation is who you are at attracted to intimately, romantically, emotionally, in terms of sexual relationships. Uh, I mentioned transgender uh, uh, before, that we have now transgender men who would be uh, assigned female at birth, um, and then transgender women would be um, assigned male at birth. And then transphobia as a last would be an, an irrational and systematic um, hostility towards people who are expressing a different uh, gender, transgender, gender diverse to what we perceived as traditional. Would you like to take the last slide and close us off, Chris? I think we must maybe just move over then to our next um, people that's going to present for us. So I'm going to hand over to Zama and to Elma. And, and they're going to talk about primary health care and, and how this also come into play. Thank you, Alma and Sama. Good afternoon, everyone. And I'm delighted to be presenting together with Sama Somi Levono um, from UKZN. Uh, let's see if I can share my slide. Can you see that? It's coming, Elma. Right, let's go to. Oh, right, here we go. Where Zama and I will be talking about the minimum package of clinical care. And I want to start with a little story. Um, in an earlier session today, Dr. Spencer spoke about stories and the importance of stories. So I'm thinking back to March 2003. There was a public health conference, and the then Minister of Health, Mantu Chabalala Simang, was going to address the conference. Now, remember, that was before the rollout of national art. And we were sitting in the audience with posters saying 600 people dying per day. And I wonder who it, at this HIV conference was there in 2003. Uh, the, the mood was very... Uh, anxious in, in, in that room. And then the minister came in and we stood up with these posters and the minister had a very hard time. And could we imagine at that time that we would have art access in every primary care clinic in South Africa today? And today is another historic moment. 
And we're extremely grateful to the HIV Clinician Society for having made it possible to develop and launch these guidelines. Will we look back in years to come and say, see how far we have come from this moment? We need better access to gender affirming care in South Africa, as Steve has already mentioned earlier. A trans woman contacted me from the northern, from a small town called Lackerson. She works as a cleaner at the school and she wanted to access hormone treatment. There was no access in the public sector in the Northern Cape. So she had to travel a hundred kilometers from Lackerson to Springbok to find a GP who was willing to prescribe hormones and that on a cleaner salary. So the, the access thing is something that needs to change. So I'll hand over to you, Zama, to discuss the role of primary care. Thank you. Thank you, Elma. And thank you, colleagues, for this opportunity. As it has been said earlier, I'm Zama Somilubuno. I come from the University of KwaZulu-Natal within the Center for Rural Health. Really, what I want to walk you through is really the introduction of gender affirming services within the primary health care. And also to describe for you how when we looked at these guidelines, how we also reflected on how the health system is set up within South Africa. May I please have the slide? So really the idea is to ensure that we are able to provide gender affirming services within primary health care. In doing this, we reflected on the Department of Health strategies and policies. We noted that in 2010, the Department of Health launched re-engineering primary health care. And really what is paramount in this process is that within primary health care, the biggest uh, principle was there was person-centeredness and health promotion. This dovetails beautifully if you reflect on what my colleagues have presented before, this informed consent. Person-centeredness says everything you do is about that individual and the services are centered around the person. And when we develop these guidelines, that's exactly what we did. So we then reflected on what was in the Department of Health policies in the aim that it would be easy to integrate with the processes. We looked at how they are doing ideal clinic. How can this then be integrated in the package of services in, in primary health care services? Further, what we noted within the setup within the primary health services or even the health system per se, it's a pyramid type of setup where at the base there is primary health care. And as you are aware, colleagues, primary health care is nest driven. And in fact, in South Africa, the health workforce is about 56% nurses. And the role they play there is that linkage and making sure that the clients and the patients are able to enter the health services. So they play that role of managing the client up and down the health services. Hence, when we did these guidelines, we looked at their scope of practice, we looked at their roles and also how the primary health care services are set up. The next slide, please. Further, when you reflect and look at the, the, the poll our guidelines, you will note that we took the sex positive approach where we are saying the primary health care provider must recognize the individual's sexuality is unique, multifaceted, and the emphasis and importance of sexual pleasure and freedom on diversity. This, again, if you would reflect, it dovetails beautifully with the person-centeredness principle and also the informed consent principle. So it's based on the client's need. What this then means is that even the sexual messaging, the health talk, it should then be targeted to the client's needs. You will find we have supported this process within our, our guidelines, so you should be able to get some resources that will support you there. Further, when we are reflecting on the setup in the South African health system, the next slide please, we noted that the health services and the system within the Department of Health and we look at primary health Okay, they are using the integrated clinical services management approach, which they call ICSM, which really says when the client comes to the facility, must be seen by one clinician, get all the services, the full package of care, seen by one individual without making the client run around. So you'll note the guidelines also pulled on that principle to make sure that once the patient is in front of this uh, clinician, they are able to offer the full package of services to affirm the gender. So what this then means. 
Not only that, we also reflected on the needs of the community, the transgender community and the gender diverse community and look at their needs and what then drives uh, their health seeking behavior. We noted that because of the stigma and discrimination that has been described earlier, many of the clients when the transgender population do end up being exposed to violence, they do end up using substances and self-destructive behavior. So in looking at that, we then package the guidelines, which when the transgender person is sitting in front of a primary care client, they can get the full package. So we looked at the violence. We know there's disproportionate high level of violence. When you look at the guidelines, you'll be supported on how to, to manage mental health issues because of the stigma, the discrimination, how then do screen and support also, what we noted earlier, the increased use of alcohol substances to assist with coping, that also is covered. Further, when we were reflecting, we noted within the department, you do have a policy that talks to sexual and reproductive health services and have sexual health and reproductive health rights, which is quite beautiful and it's quite new, uh, released in 2020. There, we're hoping this can then expand what is covered there, where it talks about how if the clients that were assigned female at birth, even if they're on hormone therapy, testosterone, they are likely to fall pregnant. How then do you support and offer fertility and contraceptive support? All that is then covered in our guidelines. Further, we also reflected on your policies and there's again on that sexual and reproductive health document that talks to cancer and cancer screening. In this case, we further expanded saying when you're doing a further cancer screening, as you see in point number five, it should be based on the anatomy that is present. Again, centered around person-centeredness. And also when you do reflect also on the guidelines, so Elma will further describe the hormone replacement therapy, there are some changes that the client will start to see. And within that, we have also guided the clinicians on what changes will be seen and how then the patient can be supported. Again, if you look at sexual and reproductive health, there are some high risk behaviors that are noted, but even there again, how then do support the clients in taking care of and, make, and maintaining safe, safer sexual practices. Again, another thing that is also stipulated if you look at the NSP document 2017 is that increased risk of HIV infection in the community. So within this, we are saying also integrate this activity. In South Africa, we are going with the 1990 process where we are saying everyone comes to the, our facilities should be offered HIV testing. How do we then incorporate this? So we've also supported on how we can do this to support the trans patients. Again, uh, Dr. Pinini did talk about the key population, the, the, the transgender community being part of the key population as it's stipulated in the NSP. And what is beautiful in the NSP is that it also again stipulates the recognition of a client as an independent agent with the capacity to make their own decision about their own health and that respect. Again, we pulled on that principle as we're looking at our guidelines. Further, what we wanted you to note as well uh, uh, when you're offering care to the transgender clients, that throughout the service, is not just in health, the population face very uh, difficult times because of the stigma and discrimination and they face a number of barriers. And some of these barriers are social, cultural, where people cannot have access to uh, documents like the identity document, which then means you can't access resources, you can't access uh, social support, you can't access housing, can't access jobs. Hence, then people end up not being able to access services. Further, if you look also even within the health services, there are some barriers that are structural in nature where the clients come in, they, in, in, they are erased within our health system, they can't access bathrooms, they are not even noted as people who do use our facilities having this, the, the transgender bodies. How do we make sure that we provide amenities, bathrooms? How do we also make sure that even as we are designing our programs, that it's around the care and the services for the individuals that is person-centered. So 
when you do look at the, the guidelines, you will note that we are giving some ideas and suggestions on how to make sure that you provide this respect, you provide this Ubuntu approach when we are offering services. Again, also to note, the colleagues have spoken about the clients may need to use a hormone therapy. One thing that we want you to note is that evidence does show that hormone therapy can also be used in conjunction with ARVs and PrEP without any significant drug interactions. There, when you look at the guidelines, you'll find the support there on how to go about doing this. Also, the one thing that we also wanted to speak to about the next slide, please, is that when we do provide hormone therapy and supporting that gender affirmation for the clients, you are likely to improve even in retention and care that talks to our retention, our trauma indicator. This may improve engagement with the health services, not only that, and then retain clients in our services, thus improve adherence and viral load suppression and improve health outcomes. All right, so at this point, I'd like to hand over to Elma to talk about the process of affirming science. All right, so when we need to examine a client, trans and gender diverse clients may find this very uncomfortable or traumatic. We need to use correct pronouns and names and only conduct a gentle examination if it's medically necessary and not be curious. In the extent of the examination, we will be aware that the client is the knowledge for body parts. So I to ask which terms for you to use. This also has a chat on non-medical gender affirming practice. And it's important for us as to be aware of this. Not surprised when we there's a moment that we so by It looks like we, we've lost Elma there. But what she was uh, describing there is the process of caring for a, 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 Are you black, Elma? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, apologies for that. It looks like the internet is playing tricks on that. Right, so we've spoken about medic non-medical gender affirming practices, and there's a whole chapter in the guidelines on that. So just as essential medicines by the South African National Essential Medicines List Committee in December 2019 for tertiary level of care. Oh, there's an echo. Um, Zalma, I wonder if you can mute. Okay, right. Is, is the echo gone now? Okay, so it was listed as essential medicines, but for tertiary level of care. And our dream is that this will change to improve access to care. The goal of hormone therapy is to affirm the client's experience gender, and it's based on the principle of informed consent. So they've already spoken about informed consent in the introduction, so I'll skip that one. The informed consent chapter talks about consent to social psychosocial care, hormone treatment, surgery, and then the complexities of informed consent with children and adolescents, as well as people living with intellectual or developmental disabilities, because there's trans people in that community as well. A hormone prescriber doesn't need a letter from a mental health provider before they can prescribe hormones. They may perform the psychosocial assessment themselves if they're comfortable. And it's important to note that the mental health condition is not a contraindication for initiating hormone treatment. 
a referral to a mental health professional is required if there's a concern about decision-making capacity or if a mental health condition needs to be addressed. And there's a recent Australian study that showed that general practitioners needed to refer only 8% of clients to a mental health professional before starting hormones, even though 50% of the clients did have some mental health condition. So the process is outlined in the guidelines where it starts with a discussion where we want to talk about the client's individual goals and discuss their hopes and expectations. We discuss the options, the possible side effects and risks and benefits. And then important to discuss fertility as well, because hormones can impact on future fertility. Then if the person wants to start hormones, we'll do a baseline assessment, which includes a detailed history, physical examination if necessary, and then certain laboratory investigations that are outlined in the guidelines. And then agree on a mode of hormone administration, um, which for feminizing therapy would be estrogen with or without an androgen, and for masculinizing therapy, testosterone. And then we will monitor the patient as we go on. For adolescents, when a trans or gender diverse adolescent experiences significant distress, with the development of secondary sexual characteristics. Pubertal suppression is an option. To halt the progression of physical changes, as this may significantly reduce their distress, is this care of pubertal suppression. In an adolescent who requests hormone treatment, a careful informed consent process needs to be followed. With the multidisciplinary team that includes a mental health provider, and the adolescent's parents or legal guardians. And fertility preservation, once again, needs to be discussed before medical treatment is started. So over to Zama to briefly discuss institutions. Thanks, Alma. So under institutions, we looked at uh, diverse uh, institutions like the correctional services, the schools, of course, in, including health services. Particularly when we are thinking of with the client who's coming to our services, how do we make sure that we retain that respect, Ubuntu, and that person-centeredness? So one of the things that maybe can support you in doing, especially people who are running facilities, the wards, the clinics, how do you set up guidelines that will guide not just the clinicians, but the whole team that is working in the health facilities. There we also touch on things like the names, the pronouns, how to respect people. We even went further and unpacked even in the African languages, how to show respect to people. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, when you don't want to gender their names, how do you do that? So all that is packaged nicely when you look at the guidelines. Further, we also looked at people now as individuals who are employees. How then do you make sure that people find that a uh, welcoming uh, setup that is non-discriminatory for the gender com uh, diverse community? Also, you'll find we've also touched on how do you do the same in the schooling or academic setup. All this is covered in the guidelines. Uh, over to you, Elma, with the voice. Yeah, so voice and communication is often closely connected to our gender identity or expression. And a trans or gender diverse client may want to sound more feminine, more masculine, or gender neutral, and may benefit from a referral to a qualified speech language therapist. And the guidelines has a whole chapter on how this can work. So, um, Zama, would you like to summarize? Yes, uh, thank you so much, Colleen. So I'm sure you have noted as we're walking you through what is covered in the guidelines that we tried as much as possible to align with how our health system is set up. The idea is that this will make it easy for the colleagues within the department to integrate these processes and these guidelines within the health system so that people can have access. Not only that, one of the things that indica is indicated with research that some of the reasons they saw such poor services for the community is because of the lack of professional tools. We are hoping with the introduction of these guidelines that we have started a journey where we can then start to develop more professional tools that can support mm -hmm. clinicians and the people who are looking after the clients with the hope that will start to increase 
health services and access and be able to save lives and offer dignity to people. So thank you very much. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity. Thank you, Zoma. And uh, I think we'll speedily hand over to uh, our next colleagues. The next talk is on mental health. So over to Elliot and Chris. Mm. Hi, everybody. I'm just getting this uh, share, screen share thing. Um, there you go. Hi. Um, so, hi, I'm, I'm Elliot, I'm a psychologist, I'm also a trans man. Um, I, it's, it's, I've been sitting here and thinking it's such a privilege actually to present um, the, the, the relatively small and short and de-emphasized mental health chapter. Um, a great part of the affirming health care over the past uh, 30, 40 years has been around pathologizing uh, people's mental state um, and, and making sure they're not crazy um, for, for saying who they say they are. And so we were quite aware of this history in, in our development um, of the guidelines. Um, and I think we, we, we tried really hard to, to walk away from that and to step away from the gatekeeping assessment driven um, way of, of providing psychosocial services to trans and gender diverse in, individuals. Um, so, so if the role of the psychologist and, and mental health care provider is not to assess for sanity, then what should we do? Um, well, quite simply, the role of the mental health care provider is basically to walk with the trans person to ensure they have enough support, to ensure that they understand what's, what's going to happen medically, um, socially, and so on. Um, in general, we, the, the, the research has shown, and, and our own experiences have also shown that in general, it's, it's best to take a life course approach. You have to recognize the impact of minority stress, stigma, and prejudice um, on trans individuals' lives and not as a pathology, the impact not as a pathology in itself, but rather we need to understand their lived experiences um, through, through the lens of the impact of minority stress and long-term discrimination and prejudice. Um, you have to understand each individual, individual in terms of the context, um, understand the complexities of assessment or evaluation, like I said earlier, um, so much of trans mental health care has been about assessment and evaluation. So, so when we talk about assessment and evaluation in this one, we need to be very clear that it's not assessing for a diagnosis of being trans enough to access medical um, services. Um, we should also aid in diagnosis where, where, where there's other issues um, at, at stake. Like I said, provide support, provide psychotherapy. A big role that psycho um, social care providers play have been playing for for trans and gender diverse people in South Africa, um, and still do is the provision of documentation, uh, specifically to access uh, gender marker change, uh, ID number change at the Department of Home Affairs, um, but also documentation for um, supporting a client's decision to undergo surgery, for example. Um, as therapists, I think as, as mental health care providers, there's a lot of gaps um, in terms of the provision of broad-based care. Um, and, and for that reason, and also considering um, the context in South Africa and Africa um, and, and the global South more broadly, um, I think it's important also that we say for this guidelines, Psychosocial care is provided not only by psychologists, registered psychologists um, and psychiatrists, but also by social workers, registered counsellors, um, potentially lay counsellors, nurse practitioners and so on, um, occupational therapists. Um, it's really important for us to start thinking about through these guidelines, how do we expand our mental health care offerings to the trans population? 
Um, I think because we are so stuck still a lot of the time on the idea of assessment and evaluation, um, we often conflate care with, with assessment or care with evaluation. And that is not the same thing. So we have to be very mindful of of the ways that we provide care to psych, uh, to trans and gender diverse people um, in context, Elma spoke of Lakishan previously in the Northern Cape. Like, how do we start a, a, a support space for, for trans people in, in, in spaces like Lakishan? Um, I think this is where psych, psychologists and, and mental health care providers more broadly um, have to step up to the activist plate and actually start addressing the, the the mental health care disparities uh, that we have um, in South Africa. Um, I'm going to I'm going to talk briefly about work, working with children and adolescents. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail because, again, our our approach is not to say here's a connect the dots approach. Each trans and gender diverse person that you see, like every other person that you see, will have their own unique context and experiences. Um, so I'm going to talk briefly about working with children and adolescents, and then I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Chris, um, who will take us through the rest and, and maybe also share some of their input on, on, on how they think these should be implemented um, in South Africa. So in terms of working with children, it's very important that gender incongruence be determined in collaboration with the child and their caregivers. Very important to involve the child here. Um, as medical professionals, we uh, are still in the very bad habit of not always listening to children and taking them seriously. Um, when talking about gender incongruence, I think it's important to remember that as for an adult who will be the most, uh, the, the biggest expert on their own gender and their own experiences, uh, we trust an adult for that and, and we should also trust children for that. Um, for children in general, social transition is the recommended intervention. Um, and, and, and if the child expresses this need, it can be facilitated by the mental health care provider. Um, ways of doing this, I think we do, do provide some ideas for doing that in the guidelines. Then working with adolescents, um, puberty is a difficult life stage for everyone. Um, if, if you add on top of puberty a set of hormones that doesn't quite gel with how you, how you are, um, it can be especially difficult or even traumatic for transgender and gender diverse adolescents. Um, and when Chris speaks later, I'm sure they'll also mention the, the trauma-informed approach that we take specifically when we're working with adults. But I think this is this, this point of puberty being super traumatic potentially for trans and gender diverse, gender diverse um, people, um, I think is a really important thing to consider because working with trans and gender diverse clients, there's a lot of trauma that always a result, uh, results from, from the start of puberty and, and experiences for, through puberty that really informs people's experiences, um, their relationships, their attachments and so on. Um, again, the mental health care practitioner should collaborate with the adolescent and their caregivers to, dis to determine the next steps, including puberty pausing treatment, which is, of course, medical treatment. Um, and in this case, I think it is very useful and, and, and super important, if, if at all possible, for mental health care providers to have good networks, multidisciplinary networks with doctors, with uh, occupational therapists, speech therapists, um, and, and anyone else who may be become involved in, in, the, um, in, a, in a, a TGD adolescence transition um, or, or other gender affirming treatment. Okay, Chris, over to you. Thanks, Elliot. So as we heard from Elliot's side, we as psychologists, myself being a clinical psychologist, but also from the mental health care field, social workers, et cetera, can, can definitely bring a lot of input um, for our trans and gender diverse children. 
Acknowledging full well that they we won't usually look at any medical aspects, they won't be the hormones that would be considered, um, and also not surgery. Um, although as the child grows up, go into puberty, obviously we then look at the puberty pausing aspect, and then as the child um, moves through then also looking um, later at uh, hormones and later then at surgery. Again, it becomes very difficult if we think, for example, the DSM that would still uh, place the trans and gender diverse person within a psychopathology. But we know that the ICD uh, process has already happened and that WHO decided and also confirmed that uh, people that's gender diverse is part of the way of being. So the moment we start working with adults, um, not all adults, not all trans and gender diverse people need to see a psychologist or a mental health provider. But there is a lot that we can offer that establishing a safe, affirming space, as we also spoke during the introduction. We, we need to be very aware that trans and gender diverse people have seen significant um, or experience significant traumas during their lifetimes. The whole idea of minority stress being part of the minority group. And, and that is aspects that we can really um, work with, with the clients and help them to become themselves in themselves and living that out into this world. Some people need more support. And like I said, some people need no support at all. At stages, we also need to work with the family, with the friends, um, if there's already a romantic partner, if they have children, and, and quite often we also then support the client in those spaces. And also as the trans and gender diverse person um, become older, there might be new challenges that they need to face. So usually it becomes very important to work as an MDT team and not just as seeing the trans person as needing our help, but becoming part of this participatory process where they also prevail, uh, give insights into the process, they drive the process, and we then become part of the support group. As um, Elliot also mentioned, support groups becomes very valuable, not just for the emotional support that trans and gender diverse people need, but also as a way of empowering one another and sharing their own wisdoms and knowledges. And by incorporating this, also finding spaces where they can go out and also engage with the world and help the world to work in new ways that it becomes equal, that it becomes affirming, and that it becomes safe for our trans and gender diverse people. I'm going to hand over now then um, to our surgeon that's going to speak a little bit about surgery and also to Anil that's going to give us a little bit more information about what's happening out there. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Chris. I uh, just want to check if everybody can see the, sh the, the screen. Yes, we can, Kevin. Great. Okay. So um, we don't need to worry with that because I, I, I think uh, everybody kind of knows uh, <laughs> everybody else in, in, in the room at the moment. But um, I just wanted to, to, to recap on uh where we are at the moment and so before covid uh we had an exponential growth in clients requesting surgery when we first started the, the combined transgender clinic at, at fritiskia in 2009 um we were seeing about 16 new clients a year and before covid happened we we probably increased that to about 100 new clients a year which is uh, really exponential. And in light of that, we have a very fixed uh, reservoir 
of services that we can provide. So we've had four operating lists since, since 2009, and we now have over 300 clients waiting for surgery. Um, and as I keep explaining to, to all the new clients that I see, that waiting list is, is getting longer and longer because of the increased number of people requesting services, um, but not having any capacity to, to, to meet that demand. So at the moment, it, certainly in the state service, we're looking at a waiting time of, of more than 25 years, which is daunting and um, worrying, to be honest. But when COVID came along, we had no elective surgery. We were doing cancer and, and trauma only, and we had very limited outpatient capacity. And that had a, a, a very large impact on um, our transgender community because firstly, they, they had problems accessing their hormones, but it also meant that, that there was no surgery that, that could be offered to them at all. So that kind of brings me on to what the guidelines mean to me. And as I've been listening to everybody talk uh, this afternoon, it's been really uh, impressive that um, what I've been thinking um is 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 true to everybody else it's an incredibly complex and interlinked service that we offer and in many ways um the things that are important about surgery is not the surgery it's the quality of the primary health care the depathologizing of transgenderism um and increasing healthcare workers awareness of uh, the transgender community and the services that that need to be offered to them and to try and do that in an affirming way which is essentially what what everybody else has been talking about and as alma pointed out earlier um the fantastic thing if, if if you look back in time and, and certainly if i look back to 2009 and before that um we have come ahead in leaps and bounds um and setting up the 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 guidelines is a huge step forward but given the amount of service that needs to be delivered we've still got a very very long way to go um but at last i think for me personally, we have something to show for 12 years of, of work in um, re-evaluating the services that we offer. And importantly, in being receptive to modifying those to try and improve the service continually. And um, so, as, as Anastasia said in, in the beginning, these are version one of the guidelines. I'm sure that they're going to be um, modified, adapted, and tweaked as we go forward. But it is a very, very good place to, to start. Um, and to reemphasize that the framework for healthcare workers, we need to um, emphasize to them that we need to be sensitive to all flavors of gender, whether that is gender fluid or um, non-binary or straightforward uh, trans men or trans women. Um, but I'm very proud of the, the quality of, of, of the guidelines that, that we've produced. Um, but I think even more important is that we need to try and standardize um, management to protect our trans and gender diverse clients so that we can minimize catastrophes. And I know as, as, as we've been talking and as we've been seeing recently, we've been saying we need better access, we need better access. But at the same time, we need to try and grasp the concept that surgery can be catastrophic if it is not done correctly. And I'm happy that, that 
that we have um, a guideline which can help to minimize the risks of, of, of that happening. Um, I think it's also very useful that we've now got a, a, a mechanism to streamline the process of recruiting surgeons capable of performing these operations competently. Um, and everything that I've learned in the last 12 years, and I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm going to learn going forwards, um, I think can be um, condensed into the guidelines so that people don't make the same mistakes along the way that, that I had to. Um, and that if we follow that, that, um, that process, we can actually provide a much, much more uh, widespread service um, to the, the, the community that, that we try and serve. Um, and hopefully to, to increase the access um, to the, the, the surgery for all our clients who not only transgender, but also uh, the, the intersex community, the um, gender non-conforming. Um, and I'm also very, very happy that the, what we've kind of illustrated in the guidelines is the uh, complexities that are involved. But by referring back to the guidelines, we've got a very robust way of trying to provide the services in a safe and um, uh, non-discriminatory way. So um, just to come back to, to what, what COVID has, has taught me is we need to try and uh, encourage our clients to get vaccinated. Um, certainly for, for surgery, they need to be um, accessing hospitals, which are COVID hotspots and will likely to be uh, entering the, the fourth wave fairly soon. Um, so one of the upsides, I suppose, to, to the waiting time is that we can try and, and get the preparation for surgery done as comprehensively as possible. Um, and fortunately, most of, of, of the clients that I've, I've spoken to have been vaccinated. And most of those who have vaccine hesitancy are at least um, receptive to the idea that, that uh, a, a vaccination is a good idea. The other great thing that I, I think COVID has, has done for us is that it has improved our recognition of the value of online consultations and online communication. Um, I was uh, chatting to a patient in Makutu the other day, and really the, the, the one plus side to, to COVID has been that um, uh, our reach has improved immensely. Um, and as part of that, we've expanded or we are looking at expanding um, the centers offering surgery uh, within the state. So Bloemfontein is, is, is very keen to get their service up and running. And it's certainly something that we'd be looking towards um, improving and, and facilitating in, in 2022 and following up on, on the initiatives with, with Tata. We were talking about uh, doing an outreach program earlier this year but the, the third wave kind of nixed all of that. And in November, uh, there is a private facility in, in Pretoria that has a, a couple of patients that um, I'll be going and helping them uh, with, with their first few surgeries so that they, they get off to a good start. Um, and possibly, well, the, the one thing that we have been talking quite a, a, a lot about in the last few weeks uh, and days is a surgical recovery plan, certainly at, at, at Hurisgia, where we're looking at a way to regain the 3,000 operating list that we've lost during COVID, which translates into about 10,000 operations. And those are not the transgender operations um, by, by, by any means, but uh, at least we, we, we have some uh, rolling mesh and inertia to saying, well, we do need to get back to surgery. And one of the, the, the fortunate side effects of that is going to be that um, if we are able to offer more day case surgery, a lot more of our transgender and gender affirming surgery, um, where the, the, the clients are ideally situated to, to being done as day cases, although not for the big operations, um, we may well be able to, to, to try and roll some of that through um, in, in the recovery plan. So uh, there's still a lot of work to do, and uh, it, it, 
it's something that we can work towards. So I've tried to gain us a little bit of time there. Uh, Anil, um, I'm interested to, to hear what you have to say. Thank you so much, Dr. Kevin, really appreciate it. I'm just going to share my screen. I'm just wanting to check, can everyone hear me and can everyone see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Anil Padavatan. I'm the uh, programs manager at Gender Dynamics. I'm a transgender man and my pronouns are he and him. And I was asked to talk to you here today about what guide, the guidelines um, mean to the clients. And, and I was asked, what does it mean to me as someone who um, uh, accesses the healthcare system in order to receive gender affirming healthcare. And I really, having thought about this topic, decided that I was completely unqualified to speak on this. I, I would like to give a, to start off as I usually do in presentations with a declaration of privilege and, and to say, I am a white middle class transgender man and I cannot speak on behalf of other members of the transgender and gender diverse community. The best thing that I can do with the platform that I have here uh, this evening is to make space for community voices that can talk about the experiences that the majority of people who um, are members of our, our community and who are attempting to access gender affirming healthcare have on a regular basis. And so with that in mind, I've consulted with uh, members of my support groups and with uh, organizations that community-based organizations that um, we as gender dynamics work with and and I'd once again also like to come back to the theme of telling some stories so so I'm going to start off with a couple of stories so the first story is my story and I'm, I'm uh, as I said uh, a person in a position of privilege I am a middle class uh, employed um person who has access to private health care i live in a large urban center and i was referred directly to a general practitioner who has a vast amount of experience in providing gender affirming health care and i was started on hormone therapy almost immediately and um during the COVID 19 lockdown i had access to telephonic consultations with my doctor and I had access to a pharmacy that delivers to my door and I had no interruption in my treatment. Um, here we are in, in 2021 and there is a um, stock out of depot testosterone in the country caused by supply chain disruptions. Um, but once again, I've had no interruption in my therapy because my doctor has been able to move me on to the much more expensive libido treatment and I continue to have access to care. And I want to just contrast that with the experience of a friend of mine, um, AP, who coincidentally has the same initials as I do, but who has had a very, very different experience in attempting to access gender affirming care. AP lives in a small town in Mpumalanga. And in 2019, when he, as a transgender man, wanted to um, start finding out how to access gender affirming hormone therapy, he contacted every state facility in his province and he was told that none of them offers gender affirming health care. Um, eventually, through his support group, he was told that the nearest um, state hospital that was offering hormone therapy was Steve Biko in Shwani. But before he could go and contact Steve Biko, the COVID-19 lockdown was announced. And he was then knocked down in a rural area in Pumalanga with his family who, whilst being a caring and loving family, are unsupportive of him as a transgender man. And he experienced a great deal of dysphoria and also uh, symptoms of depression. And he really struggled and had a hard lockdown. Um, and now we here we are in 2021 
um, at level one. And he is once again attempting to access gender affirming healthcare. And when he managed to contact Steve Biko Hospital, he was told that they have a waiting list and they are not taking on any new patients at this time. He then explored the possibility of starting uh, care in the, through the private sector and um, unfortunately came to the conclusion that given the fact that he only has a part time job, um, which does not pay much money, he's not able to start that through the private sector either. And so his experience at the moment is that he's still unable, um, three years later, to access gender affirming healthcare. And I think that this is, is very much the experience of the majority of, of members of the trans and gender diverse community in South Africa and in Southern Africa is just the inability to access gender affirming healthcare. And then there's also the other side of, of just trying to access the healthcare system and, and the barriers that we experience on an ongoing basis in just trying to get ordinary healthcare. Um, and and the, the organizations and people who I spoke to had raised the following concerns and, and, and following issues. And um, the, the, the experience of disrespect and misgendering, which continues in healthcare facilities to today, where one uh, person I spoke to said, talked about their experience of going to their local primary healthcare facility and said, I asked them why they're still using incorrect pronouns when I've been coming to this clinic for eight years. And in my file, it states that I am a transgender woman. And the nurse replied that since my ID says that I'm male, it would be illegal for them to address me as she. And, and this is an elderly member of our community who has been, and as she said, fighting to have her gender identity recognized since the 1970s when she was arrested for impersonating a woman. Um, and, and then you have someone who's talking about attempting to access gender affirming healthcare and says, I have been so stressed. I have been emotionally ready to start hormones for more than years now, but I can't afford it. And then the concerns about the interrogation that community members face when accessing healthcare facilities, um, especially public healthcare, because you have these multiple points where you have to um, go and sort of announce yourself and bring your file to the next, uh, to the first to the reception, um, then to the, the counter where you get your file, then to the clinic where you're attempting to, to get services, then to the doctor, then to the nurse. And at each point, people get interrogated. And, and the uh, members of a community-based organization said, we are concerned about the prying and uh, questions and invasive interviews in public spaces by healthcare practitioners, which can be very uncomfortable and upsetting for our community members. And all of this is taking place in a context where we are, as a, tr as a trans and gender diverse community, a community because of our marginalization, because of the discrimination we experience, a community that bears a disproportionate burden of uh, a health, care, a health uh, burden. And so I'd like to take us back once again to another theme that, that came up right at the beginning with, with, uh, has been raised by Dr. Anastasia and by Chris and by, by all the speakers, which is the, the issue of human rights. And in terms of our constitution, we, we all have the right to access to healthcare services, including reproductive health care. And the state is required by the constitution to take reasonable legislative and other measures with available resources to retrieve the progressive realization of this right. And as Dr. Kevin has just outlined, gender affirming health care is really only available at the moment at a handful of, of um, uh, tertiary state hospitals. Even in the private sector, there is literally only a handful of doctors who are regularly and with a great deal of experience providing gender affirming health care. And stigma and discrimination remain significant barriers to accessing general health care um, services. And I think that this is really where the guidelines are providing us with an opportunity to really start moving forward in our, the progressive realization 
of health rights for the trans and gender diverse community. We've got an opportunity here to renew our efforts in terms of advocacy, in terms of extending access to health care, to bring to realize the right of access to health care for all. And then there's the right to human dignity. So the right to human dignity is actually a central value of our democracy. It's a core value of our constitution. And when members of the trans and gender diverse community are afraid to access the healthcare system because they fear being insulted, misgendered, subjected to repeated or invasive questioning and publicly outed where they're asked about their gender identity in public waiting rooms. It's not only their right to healthcare that is violated, but also their right to human dignity. And our hope is that the guidelines will can be used to foster a culture of respect for human dignity in both the state and the private healthcare systems. And so that's, I think, in everyone I spoke to, the real hope for the guidelines is for the realizing our dream of equity, where as a community that carries a disproportionate burden of ill health, and that's strongly associated with the poverty and marginalization that most members of the trans and gender diverse community are subjected to. Where historically our health seeking behavior when we try to access gender affirming healthcare so that we can live healthy, fully human lives, we have been met with suspicion and paternalism and gatekeeping. Um, our hope is that the publication of the guidelines is a catalyst to change the way in which trans and gender diverse persons are treated within our healthcare system. Because we need healthcare, access to healthcare for all, not just for the lucky, like myself. And this means acknowledging and courageously addressing the multiple and intersecting systems of disadvantage and privilege that shape all of our lives. And I would like to end my presentation by giving my sincere thanks to everyone who contributed to, um, uh, to the presentation today, um, including the Sisterhood Collective in Cape Town, the Fairy Godmother Project in Hanover Park, and to my brothers at the FTM Brotherhood Online Support Group, thank you to all of you so much. Um, and now I would like to hand back to Dr. Anastasia, over. Thank you so much, Anil. Thank you so much, Kevin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chris, Savuka, Elliot, Alma, Zamasomi. Thank you, everyone who worked on this incredible project. Too many of you to name. Um, before I close, I'll just have come through in, in the chat. Um, so a, a vote of thanks to Alma for speaking about history as part of the launch. Um, a vote of thanks to, to Zuki, to Steve, and to myself um, for leadership, um, which I'll, I'll accept on everyone's behalf with gratitude and thanks. Um, some very important comments around how some of the language that we as clinicians are very accustomed to using um, is in fact pathologizing and can be damaging towards communities. And I think this was also addressed in the, the text chat to say that it has been a challenge for some of the people involved in this um, process to think about the role of language. Um, and I think that we do address it in the guidelines, but it, it's, it's a work in progress and, and certainly it's important. We have a responsibility to keep up to date. So thank you for, for calling us out on that. Um, you know, part of this process is that we are open to the, the reflection and the feedback. Um, and then also just clarifying that, that the needs of transgender and intersex communities are, are quite different. Um, we took a, a very considered approach in developing the guideline um, to say that, that we were not the right group of people in the right space in the right time with the right kind of collaboration and community links. Um, to address the needs of of um, of intersex communities, um, and and perhaps that is something that could come out in in future iterations, or perhaps in its own document at some point. 
Um, and then the last comment to say that not all intersex folk do want surgery, and I absolutely, absolutely um, agree with that. Um, and then also just another vote of thanks to Kevin for his role in developing the surgical techniques and expertise in South Africa, and to Neil for sharing like that. Um, what I what I want to say um, really in closing here is, Neil, you you shared some experiences about your your gateway to accessing care. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that you could go to a doctor, get access to the care immediately that you needed, that you were protected against the supply chain shortages. Um, and you contrasted it so, so poignantly with the experiences of, of someone else whose background and, um, context looks different. I'm going to use the last few minutes that I have to speak about my own experiences. And, and again, I put out a privilege disclaimer, you know, I'm a white upper middle class, college educated medical degree holding um, woman. I, I, I am a trans woman. I am a, a lesbian trans woman. I am a, an asexual trans woman, but I have a lot of privilege. Um, I came out in 2015. I was outed, actually. I was outed, in fact, against my will, <laughs> without my consent. We speak about informed consent as part of the guidelines. I I, I did not give consent. I was outed. Um, and I suffered some consequences for that. I was working as a GP in Johannesburg. I, I effectively lost the position that I had. Um, I went unemployed for for quite a long stretch of time in South Africa, um, where we're short of doctors, I couldn't I couldn't find employment because I was trans. Um, I wanted to open my own private practice, and I couldn't rent property to do so because I was trans. Um, but that's not what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about is my experience accessing gender affirming care because. I got to a point, and I wish I had more time to tell the story, but I'll try to do it as best justice as I can. I realized that I needed access to care in order to continue surviving. And for the first time in my life, um, my, my self-love and my determination to look after myself kind of outweighed my self-destructive tendencies, the same self-destructive tendencies that led me to medical school and made me sacrifice so much of myself. You know, at one point in time, I aspired to be a, a cardiothoracic surgeon because um, I, I rather fancied the idea of a life where I was on call three or four or five times a week. But I wanted to look after myself, wanted to do it by the book. Um, so I went to go see a psychiatrist. He knew I was a doctor. Um, I went during a, a lunch break from the private practice. I was presenting as male. He was quite upset to see that. He was an expert in the field, allegedly. Um, I'm not going to name and shame because it's these are institutional problems I'm talking about. And, and I hope that even the individuals involved in the story have grown and changed since that time. Um, or else I hope they'll read the guidelines and that that will allow them to do so. I went to see him. I was interrogated for an hour and a half sitting in front of him and being subjected to all kinds of dehumanizing questions about whether I stand or sit when I urinate, about whether I played with my sister's Barbie dolls as a child. I told him I didn't have a sister. He was not impressed. He said that was no excuse. Um, whether I walked around in my mom's high heel shoes. You know, all of the, the typical um, components of this archetypal trans narrative at one point, and this is a direct quote, he, he asked me if I wear, and I apologize for the language, um, he asked me if I wear skirts and dresses that are so tight and so short that my dick hangs out the bottom when I walk like all of the other trannies. I was horrified in the moment. I felt absolutely minuscule, so small. I did myself a disservice that day because I answered all of his questions. Not once did I did I say to him, this is completely inappropriate and storm out. Because this is what I had to do to get access to care. He referred me eventually for 
psychology. We spent three months talking about the weather. They wanted me to spend another three months getting therapy that I didn't need at that point in my life. Eventually, I came to sit in front of the endocrinologist. And the first thing that she said to me was, if you're serious about this, why haven't you self-medicated? And it stung. It was such a slap in the face. Because I thought about it, and I thought, who am I to, to figure it out for myself? There are experts. There are people I can trust. They didn't respect me as a colleague, as a fellow medical doctor. They certainly didn't respect me as a human being. I realize that these experiences echo so many of those in the trans community who have been forced to become their own scientists, their own researchers, their own clinicians, who have been second-guessed, invalidated, undermined, and condescended to in much the same way that I was. You know, I, I never expected to become an activist. And I say to people in this community, there is no imperative upon you to be an activist, but we all are, because every breath that we draw is this radical act of defiance against the system that would soon as see us dead than successful. The difference is when I teach clinicians, I say to them, you must be an activist. It is your responsibility. You hold the power and you have to wield it in a way that is responsible, in a way that is ethical, in a way that protects and enshrines human rights, whether it's in line with your own personal beliefs, religious beliefs, social conditioning or not, you have a responsibility to respect and uphold and protect human rights. This guideline is a first step, but it's an important one. And I hope that if nothing else, it will go out into the world and help those whose human rights are in jeopardy to advocate for themselves and help those clinicians who have the best of intentions in their hearts but not all of the information because they were disadvantaged by the same system that doesn't care about people in my community because it didn't teach them. It didn't empower them with the skills and the knowledge. And I hope it will allow those clinicians to be their best selves and to give the best service that they can to their clients, to their patients. Thank you for your attendance. It has been a privilege for us, and I hope it's been so for you. Let me wish you all a good